You guys need a moment? or I brought candy for audience participation purposes. Which, which, what's that? A, y yeah, yeah. That's later and what's left. So if I don't throw it all out, coming after you, big boy. Actually, yes. <laughs> okay, uh, you guys can read the. Oh, are we read. Yeah. We good? Okay, go ahead. All right, as you can read, this is selling security using the techniques of propaganda to instill a culture of security. I mean, why did I read that? I don't know. You guys can read just as well as I can, I hope. Probably better. Uh, this is me, Christian, father. My son turns one today. Even though he's sick at home, he's still cute. Uh, hacker, just another security guy, fell in a hole. That's my Twitter handle. I mostly just go on there to make fun of things, but feel free. Uh, I'm not a psychologist, propagandist, or a lawyer, so good luck. Uh, I gave this talk at B-Sides Pittsburgh and put this in here, and I'm going to give you the same advice I gave them. I don't care what you do, just be involved in something. Hackers for Charity, your local organization, go out there and use the skills that you've come to acquire in the community that you live in to help the community you live in. You know, soup kitchen, whatever. <clears throat> okay, these, these two uh, quotes I'm going to read, and they kind of sum up the entire talk. The first one is by a guy named Edward Bernays. There is a consequently a vast and continuous effort going on to capture our minds in the interest of some policy or commodity or idea. Basically meaning there is always somebody trying to sell you something. Oh, by the way, when I get nervous, I tend to swear, and I'm going to try not to, but it might happen. Sorry. All right, good. The other one is uh, from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. It's, I'd just rather use the unlimited power of my imagination because I ain't got no damn money. And that is the truth. This is my hobby. And if that's not the saddest thing you've heard all year, uh, wow. So, last October, I had some unexpected time on my hands towards the first part of the month. And I got to watching a web series called Stuff They Don't Want You to Know, which is kind of conspiracy theory-ish, but, you know. And they had an e the show on Edward Bernays who was a propagandist, and then I just kind of started doing research, figure out who this guy was, read his book, he's dead, so you're not going to get it signed, but it's out there, and I, I don't have a link to it, but I can get one. Who knows what this is from? You, shout it out, man. Yes, per, yeah, shout it out. That's right. What What is Rocky Horror Picture Show famous for? Audience participation. That's why I brought the candy. Okay. So, who coined the term propaganda? Yes, the chubby guy in the back. <laughs> hey, the Reese's Cups throw great, by the way. Does anybody know who coined the term? Anybody? Guesses. Come on. I give candy for bad answers. U.S. government. No. You got to fetch it yourself. The Pope, the Catholic Church, coined the term propaganda. It comes from Latin to propagate. Haha. <laughs> it was a committee of how to get more people interested in being Catholic, spreading the word. So, through the years, we go to this, and 200 years later, definition didn't change. 200 years later, still really didn't change. Now we get to the modern definition. The religious aspect is pretty much gone. Nobody knows or cares. And if you can read the uh, the middle one, uh, ideas or statements that are often false or exaggerated, That this kind of took a turn from trying to get people to be Catholic to just false and misleading, misleading statements. We, uh, we, we kind of we took a turn south on that one. So, its original meaning is basically just selling ideas. That's it. And I'm using the original meaning and not the... The ones we got up here. <clears throat> so, propaganda is split into three types. It's denoted by color, white, red, and gray, gr white, gray, and black. No, I didn't pick them. They designate how clearly you can identify the source. It has nothing to do with accuracy. It does not indicate any of the content of the message, just that you know who it came from. 
So we'll start with white propaganda. Easy. Clear attribution. You know who put it out. Generally tends to be accurate. Eh. Uh, but it, it's clear. The U.S. has a lot of truth and advertising laws that tend to protect protect people. But here, hold on. So um, on the left is an example of white propaganda. The U.S. government wants you to join the Army. I just picked it. If anybody, the other branches are offended here, I'm sorry. It's just the first one I picked online because everyone knows this picture. The other is from the Got Milk campaign, which I'm assuming everybody, except for maybe that guy, knows. And does everybody remember the Got Milk campaign? And they got super famous. Does anybody know who directed the first Got Milk ad? I found this interesting. It was Michael Bay. And it was uh, about the guy who shot Aaron, or, or Aaron Burr, shot Alexander Hamilton, and it was an amusing, it was really cool. But Michael Bay directed that. I thought that was cool. Um, just to kind of prove that white propaganda isn't always happy, fluffy, and upright, there's something called armed propaganda. And if you get this approved in any of your InfoSec planning, I would love to hear about it. Back, uh, excuse me, in the 70s, a group called the Weather Underground, which the current weather service is named after, so think about that for a little bit, decided to blow up a statue of the thinker, Rodin's thinker, everyone knows that, just to prove the point that they could blow stuff up for political pressure. They knew who did it because, and you can't really see it, but right on the, the pedestal, they signed their name poorly. But you, it's a black and white photo. It was the 70s. You've got to give them some slack. But they use this propaganda to basically try and, you know, advocate the overthrowing of the U.S. government. So it was clear. The attribution is there. We know who did it. But that doesn't mean it's a happy, friendly message. But that's all relative, depending on whose side you're on. All right. Black propaganda. Unknown source. Or known source, but it's a deception. You may think you know who put it out, but you really don't. Um, this leads into a, a clear distinction between disinformation and misinformation. You can be misinformed and just wrong, but if someone has disinformed you, maybe, I don't know, then they've intentionally lied to you, spreading false or misleading information. That's important. Black propaganda is generally disinformation in a lot of ways. <clears throat> so on the left is a great example of uh, World War II propaganda from the Japanese. They uh, distributed these flyers, basically, in the Philippines to dissuade the Filipinos from supporting America by hosting a flyer from the U.S. that says, don't sleep with Filipino women, they will give you venereal disease. I, I don't know how well it worked. I, I thought it was interesting. It's a tactic to take, but, I mean, winning popular support is important, right? The second one on the right is from Vietnam, where, this is interesting, the U.S. built an entire island village, and they would abduct people from North Vietnam, take them out in speedboats, and show them this village of the Sacred Sword of the Patriot League, a group resisting the Viet Cong takeover of North Vietnam. And they would tell them how great and how they're planning on overthrowing Vietnam and winning, and, oh, and then take them back and hope that they spread that information out. And, once again, I don't know how well it was, how effective it was, but it's kind of interesting. They spent a good bit. If you want to look that up, it's Maxog during the Vietnam War. They did a whole bunch of psychological operations during Vietnam. And one of my personal favorite. I don't know who put this out. I found it on the Twitters. Um, okay, I, I'm hoping this is propaganda. Honestly, I have not called the number. Uh, I hope the NSA is not using toilet cams, but I'm, the message here is that, you know, they're using toilet cams. Maybe we should stop and think about the mass surveillance thing, basically. Okay, so great propaganda. We're kind of in the middle. It's a little tricky. We don't know who put it out, or in some, a lot of times we don't even always know the purpose for which they put it out. Uh, one of Goebbels, you know, the Nazi 
propaganda minister guy's main principles was to control all of the media, and he would use a lot of great propaganda in the form of newspaper opinion columns or newspaper stories, just putting them out to control what people saw. You didn't know, I mean, you read the paper now, you don't know if that guy exists. You know, Frank from Ann Arbor wrote in, and Frank's probably not real. Okay, so I've got a really cool example of great propaganda, which I didn't find out about until I was researching this. You guys remember all those, like, uh, piano staircase where you walk up and down and it makes sounds and encourage people and they put it next to an escalator and people would think, yeah, yeah, this is yes, no. Okay, nothing? Oh, fine, do that one. Anyway, <clears throat> what Volkswagen did was they actually sponsored those in uh, something called the fun theory, where they take things and make them fun. So, here we have, you know, you can read. You know, I'm going to narrate anyway. So this dude's building a little bottle bank machine. And this is pure gamification. Look, look at him. Hard at work. He's German. So I should be saying this in a German accent, but I'm not going to. Look at that. That looks fun as hell. So just to kind of fast forward through this. They put this thing next to a bunch of regular bottle repositories to recycle them. And look at those confused German people. And they figured it out. It's kind of like watching 2001 where the monkeys touch the obelisk. But what they did find is when they put the bottle bank next to the regular ones, that the bottle bank arcade was used way more often because we got a reward. We got to see the score tick up. We got to see blinky lights. But just like most video games, and don't tell your kids, those blinky lights and scores don't really mean much in the real world. You can't pay your bills with that, trust me. Yeah, <laughs> that little kid was all happy. But Volkswagen released this, and it was kind of a great propaganda thing. Their point was to try and save the environment, but they didn't attach their name to it. You can't see it in the video here, or even if you look up close. But Volkswagen's name is not associated with these when they released them. It is now, because money, but when they released them, it wasn't. Oh, this is a great one. Uh, apparently, there's a store in England called Freshers. It's an example of great propaganda because they leaked their own coupon and then claimed that somebody else leaked their own 40% off coupon. And they made a killing that year in the liquor and wine market because even with a 40% off all wine, I would... I would totally use that. Um, started out as gray. Once it was exposed, it went to white. Just like when Gandalf died and came back. Gray, white. Now we know who did it. It's clear attribution. But we only know that who did it because they released it afterwards that they were the ones responsible. So, you want to start an InfoSec program? Go read Bill's book. He is a, and I copied this from the Facebook, so you know it's legitimate, a thought leader in the cybersecurity space. I'm, yeah, 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 I wish. Anyway, go read Bill's book. There's a lot of information out there on, yeah, that one. There's a lot of information out there on how to set up an uh, InfoSec training program. A lot of it's crap, but there's the information. You're going to have to do it yourself, pretty much. Sorry. There's not too many, if it's one thing I've learned over the years, there's not too many kits that you can buy and just plug in and they work how they should right out the box in anything, not just InfoSec. However, I will tell you how to start implementing propaganda. Step one, determine what you want to accomplish. That's pretty much the step one for everything. These aren't magic steps either, kids. Sorry. Um... You kind of have to determine what you want to accomplish and what you can't accomplish. There's no silver bullets. You're not going to be 100% effective at everything or anything. Um, step two, prioritize and plan. Basically, you want to start hitting the the low-hanging fruit, you know, depending on what that is. Do people um, piggyback when they go through the security doors? Do they talk to strangers and they shouldn't, you know? If you don't have an InfoSec program, you can start using this to build one. If you do, just use this to supplement it. 
<clears throat> and this is kind of the tricky one, and this is where you got to get creative. You have to determine the message and the media and which one works best for each other. Sometimes things work better in video that don't work in print, and some things work better, better in audio that don't work in either. And there's no hard, fast rules. It all depends on what you create. Sorry, I can't give you any great examples. I do have... Friend of, sorry, a friend of mine, his wife, owns a graphic design company, and I asked, because I got her a job, for a favor to make me some propaganda-style posters, and she did for free, so I don't know how much it would cost to make, but she printed them out, and she made them, I printed them out at Walmart, they look really good, sorry, if you want to come up afterwards and take a look, if you, want, if you really feel strongly about it, you can come up afterwards and keep one, probably, yeah, no, <laughs> Not yet. Step four, wash, rinse, repeat. Keep going. And it's InfoSec awareness. you got to basically keep trying new things, trying different things. You're not going to win. You just have to fight as hard as you can. Sorry. That's depressing, but it's honest. Okay. Now back to happier fun stuff. How and why propaganda works. Propaganda works by one of the following methods, if not all the following methods, depending on which level. Logical arguments, desire, simple suggestion, repetition, and then combinations of each. And we've all seen this. Logical argument. Crest is better than other toothpaste that I'm not thinking of right now. Or this one's better than this one. Generally, this is the most common form that you'll see. Kind of. You usually see this tied in with other little tricks and traits. Um, we all like to think that we're logical, rational people, that all of our decisions are based off of reason. They're not. There's a lot of emotion and a lot of other factors involving each of our decisions every single day at every level. Um, they've done studies of people who are emotionally crippled, as it were, and not like, you know, Daddy touched me when I was young, crippled. People who don't have as much emotion, and they've done studies where they've handed them two pens and said, here, fill this piece of paper out and pick a pen. And they spend a half hour trying to decide which pen would be better to figure out this paper because they have no emotional response to say, just pick the blue one. It'll be fine. Emotion really factors into propaganda and humans a lot more than we like to admit. So here's a logical example. Try that. Four out of five dentists surveyed. It's a logical statement, even though we all know how they came up with that. It's complete BS. It's not 80%. It's literally four out of five after a set of random samplings. And the one on the right is just an anti-piracy message, which I thought was funny. Um, but it's still a logical statement saying, don't pirate films, you're crippling our industry. Whether or not it's accurate, we know who put it out. It's white propaganda. We're entirely sure what message they're trying to get across, and who's saying it. Does anybody know what that is? Anybody? Anybody? <sighs> yeah. Uh, close enough. Sorry. Yeah, this is uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the bottom. Food, sleep, sex, a lot of things. And you go up from there. Basically, you have to have the bottom ones. You don't really care about being creative when you can't breathe, eat, or sleep. It's just a fact. Uh, Maslow was a social psychologist, and I'd like to read this quote if, just because I can. Ha <laughs> ha. The influence of desire in bringing about the acceptance of an idea is exhibited by all men, and in the case of society at large, is far greater than that of our logical processes. Now, breaking that down, it's basically saying that there is more than the individual to make up society. And we're not autonomous. We don't all think the same. Our decisions are affected at a lot of levels by a lot of things, all of which are contained in that pyramid. Um, very subtle and not so subtle ways. So um, on the left, you see a group of what appear to be volleyball players. How ironic. And a guy on the bottom. I, I don't think that we're... Uh, is anybody unclear of what this is trying to sell? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, that's basically sexuality right there in a 
box, can, spray thingy, whatever. On the right is a little bit more nuanced, meaning I think that's LeBron. Sorry, I'm not a sports guy. Basically, you want to be that guy, and they put him in a picture in a great pose of him doing something cool, and you're emulating and feeling some sort of attachment with him. This is not going to work on me. This might work on somebody else. Mostly because if I didn't know who he was, well, I know he plays basketball, but that's about it. But there's other things that work on me, because we're, we're all not immune to this. It's great. Um, simple suggestion. Simple suggestion is just that. An idea, an implanted stub to make you draw inference to other things. You don't bring up opposing, opposing viewpoints. You use direct and simple statements that are easy to repeat and eventually will lead to being believed. Not always verbal. Imagery is very common. It relies heavily on inference. So in April, we got a new dog. My wife brought this dog home from the pound. Not the Humane Society, because that sounds way nice and cleaner. The pound. And then she dropped a little tidbit of, well, you have to watch, because dogs from pounds generally tend to have fleas. At which point in time, I started itching uncontrollably for days. The dog didn't have fleas, but I was sure she did. Yeah, it was great. Um, the right-hand side is a Pepsi in a cool, refreshing flow of water. Makes me want to drink Pepsi right now. Look at that. Wow. On the left-hand side is a picture I took at my daughter's daycare that says, if you can't read it, I'm lucky because my daddy drives the car. I don't know why that kid thinks that they're lucky because daddy drives the car. Maybe they have a car that daddy drives. Or what's going through my head is, mommy's a really bad driver. Or, But I'm inferring. I have nothing to back that up, and I had to black out the kid's name. Even if you see Maria, you don't see her message. I blacked out the kid's name just not to offend this kid's mommy and or daddy. Yeah. So, inference. We see these things, and we all pick up different you know, messages from them. If enough people pick up the same message, Pepsi see a spike in sales. Or poor little what's-his-name's kid, mommy gets driving lessons, whatever. Repetition. Uh, everyone knows what repetition is. I will go over the two-factor theory because it's kind of cool. If you hear something over and over and over again, eventually it'll sink in until a point you become sick of it. Everyone has a different point at which they become sick of hearing it, but eventually most people will get to that point, which is why you don't like to hear that song on the pop stations 9,000 times in a row. However, it is a very effective form of advertising and propaganda, just like this. Okay, everyone's seen Coke. Who's, who's done that on the right? Nobody's had to write on the whiteboard 100 times? Yeah, I figured Tom would. Okay, so this kind of leads me, I'm trying to get through some of the stuff so I can do some more question and answer, because I like to torture people. Instilling a culture of security. You need to have achievable goals. They don't need to be measurable, but it would help. Um, start with your big ones. People don't lock their workstations. Bill Gardner has a little slip of paper that he puts on people's workstations. He locks them and puts a slip of paper saying, Hey, I could do something malicious. It's a good tactic. Uh, maybe your people aren't escorting visitors. Maybe they'll just drop them off, and they need to be. Uh, pick something. Work on it. Uh, plan out a time frame, because you need one. Propaganda campaigns are generally short. You can't keep going on because of the two-factor theory, and people are just going to be sick, and they're going to tune out the message. Um, there's nothing saying you can't switch it up and use two different sets of techniques to achieve the same goal. It's, it's a tactic. You just have to plan it out. And there's no hard, fast rules. You need to keep long-term notes on what's going to be effective and what's not going to be effective. And you need to change tactics as you get more information. That's pretty standard. That's in everything. It's not just this. Um, you need to remember that you're trying to change behavior, which is hard to make people more mindful of security, which is harder. 
because it gets in the way of making money sometimes, which is really, really hard. And it won't happen overnight, unless you get that arm propaganda thing approved, in which case <laughs> you'd be surprised what people do when they're threatened. Um, things you can and cannot do. You can influence people's behavior. Constant repetition will eventually get the message through to people, and some people will change. Not everybody, but some people. Sometimes they'll drop another security good practice to implement this one, but you're going to have to work on it. Things you can't do is increase productivity. Yes, they tried. No, it doesn't work. Goebbels tried in a lot of the factories, even for people they weren't pressing into slave labor in Nazi Germany, and it didn't work. Uh, other than the armed propaganda thing, you can't force people, once again, even then. And as I said many times, you're not going to be 100% anything. It's not going to work 100% of the time for 100% of the people. <clears throat> as I said, working with uh, working within your security awareness program, get management buy-in, work with the group, group in charge of security if that's not you. If it is you, it's going to be easier. And use whatever mediums you have available. Sometimes you can't pop out video. Sometimes you can't make posters. You know, but those cost me forty bucks, and I made three of them, minus the candy, which was ten. So whatever. Uh, going back to the fun theory, make it fun. Gamification. Adrian has a whole bunch of the gamified lock pick tutorials out there. Yeah, it's using game techniques to teach lock picking, but you could apply it to other things. As, you know, the bottle bank showed, or the, the piano stairs thing. Use this to fill in the gaps. It's going to be a constant barrage, a new message. Most people do InfoSec once a year if they do it at all. And that once a year training is usually a crappy CBT, or cattle called into the auditorium where some guy spits a bunch of policy at you and then you leave. And that's, uh, I don't know about you guys, but to me that's not effective uh, Security awareness at any level. Um, start trying to grow one from the ground up if you don't have one. If you do have one, start filling in the blanks. People are people. You need to shoot for the lowest common denominators. I don't want to sound mean, but not everything's going to work on everybody at the same level. Simple phrases, inference, repetition. Gamification. Okay. And the next series of slides is a bunch of cultural change examples that I've picked from propaganda that we can hopefully get some lessons out of. And I want you guys to tell me what lessons are we can apply. So. I, I kind of tried to do this Jeopardy style, but I failed. So, yeah. This is the first person arrested for refusing to give up their seat to a white person in Montgomery, Alabama. Come on, there's candy on the line. Who's that? You think? Rosa Parks was arrested December 1st, 1955, which started the year-long boycott. You're right, it's not. It's Claudette Colvin, whom nobody's ever heard of, even though she was, ended up being a major civil rights leader. The reason the NAACP did not decide to go with her story is because she was 15 and pregnant while unmarried at the time in... Alabama in the South in the 50s. They chose, and I, I agree with them from a message standpoint, to not go with her story because it would there were too many things that people could use to detract from. You know, it seemed to work okay in the end, but they wanted the focus to be entirely on the issues and not just the person. So, what lesson can we take away from that? Oh, come on. Anybody. That's a good lesson. Choose your battles. Choose your examples. Yeah. Pick the best example you can. Now, it's a balancing act because you can't just sit around and wait for the perfect storm to come around. For You don't want to get breached just to say, hey, we can get breached. But, you know, you don't want to just pick a random... You don't want to do cross-site scripting with alert zero because it doesn't mean anything to anybody else. Okay. Has anybody ever heard the term torches of freedom? 
Of course not, because this is in the 1920s. What were women allowed to do with torches of freedom? Come on, anybody. Dumb answers accepted. You can still get candy. Yeah. No. No, that would be awesome. Smoke! Yay! So. Oh, that's a fast break. Those are awesome. Um, Edward Bernays, working with Lucky Strike Cigarette Companies, decided that women were not smoking their product enough. So, he instructed Lucky Strike to support the women's suffrage movement. And to do this, he encouraged women to smoke in public to be equal to men. He called them torches of freedom, which is all kinds of awesome and ironic, especially given today. Um, he actually worked with them a lot. See the, the, like the dark green Lucky Strike coloring? He hosted an entire green ball just so that people would smoke Lucky Strike cigarettes and recognize the color green and match it up with women's suffrage and high fashion at the time. The guy was a genius. He was Sigmund Freud's double nephew, which is a weird family tree, but, you know, it worked great. So, what lessons can we take away from this? Oh, come on. You guys are deceptive. How about sometimes the best message isn't, you know, just because you're putting something out there doesn't mean it's always 100% correct. Clicking on every email attachment is not going to get you owned. Clicking on certain email attachments might. It's, it's still kind of a pick your battles, pick your message sort of ideal. But I think there's a lesson to be taken away in that. And the fact that he was able to link things together that had no real relationship to get back to increased sales with Lucky Strike. And they, they used him a lot. All right. How about this one? His cartoons were instrumental in fighting racism during World War II. Anybody? Come on, come on. It's a fast break. These things are awesome. Who? Norman Rockwell? Oh. You gonna catch that? I'm getting better. Dr. Seuss. Most people don't know that before he started writing children's books, and still while he's writing children's books, he was a political cartoonist. And that cartoon says something about using the black keys and the white keys. He was trying to increase production output for World War II. I said before, you can't increase production output unless, of course, you add workers, and that's a good way to do that. So his message isn't so much, you need to be more productive, it's we need to have more people doing this. Um, fun fact, he did kind of support the Japanese internment during World War II, and if you don't know what that is, it means you're young and you don't know what's going on in World War II, you should look that up. It was a horrible time in America. Uh, but he, he, he later came to terms with that. It was way better. So what lessons can we take away from Dr. Seuss, other than trying new things like green eggs and ham? Anything? That's a very unconventional way of getting a message out. I wouldn't have thought of drawing a political cartoon to help end racism. Anybody? Anybody thought of that? So, Okay. The United Fruit Company found out that they could buy bananas at 25 cents a bunch in the Caribbean and sell them for $3.25 a bunch in Boston. That is a lot of money to be made from fruit. So, in 1944, the Guatemalan dictatorship was overthrown for democracy, and they started exporting bananas. United Fruit quickly became Guatemala's largest exporter, exporter employer, and landowner. The Guatemalans weren't particularly happy with this scenario. So they uh they elect they had an election and they elected that guy and he decided to redistribute United Fruit's land back to the people of Guatemala. United Fruit had a problem with this, as you know, I could understand too. They hired Edward Bernays, yes, the lucky strike cigarette guy, to try and persuade forcefully Guatemala to give up their current government and give them back their bananas. So 
Just a quick poll. How many people do you think it would take to conquer the country of Guatemala? What? Wow, really? Damn. Don't mess with that guy. Check. With a group of 480 soldiers in nine days and using a lot of propaganda techniques, including broadcasts out of Florida that claimed to be out of Guatemala, the U.S. helped overthrow the Guatemalan government for a bunch of bananas, which were as a multi-million dollar business back then, but still. Uh, fun fact, Guatemala was not the first banana republic, which is what this is inferring to, not just a store at the mall. A banana republic is a crappy dictatorship puppet government that is used to funnel fruits, namely bananas, to another controlling entity. Honduras was actually the first country that was a banana republic. So, you know, while we didn't come up with the idea, that's, you know, we still used it. <coughs> As I said, they relied on a lot of disinformation, and they caused the government to crack down on their own people, which led to the downfall in nine days with 480 soldiers. That's amazing. So, anybody take anything away from that? I don't, even if I could get 480 people, I don't think I can conquer a country. I don't even think I could conquer Delaware with 480 people, and it's only got three counties. So... I think you can do a lot if you're using a lot of different tactics and a lot of different uh, methods of swaying public opinion and trying to instill ideas in people, right or wrong or indifferent. Um, if you're my friend on Facebook, I'm pretty much pro-vaccine. If you're not, we can talk later. That's great. I think I'm still going to win. Everybody know about Jenny McCarthy? Yeah, and the, the body count. Yeah, so Jenny McCarthy read a paper in two th that was published in 1998 that linked the MMR vaccine with autism. The paper was later fully retracted in 2010 and partially retracted in 2004. The United States set up a House Commission uh, Oversight Committee to actually look into the study to see if there's any accuracy. And they didn't, but there was still a victim's injury compensation fund set up for people who were harmed from vaccines. Most people who are harmed vaccine, from vaccines are because of allergies, because most vaccines are big, based off of eggs. Just a fact. Um, on the right here is just kind of a showing how many people in the U.S. throughout the years have been killed for various reasons. Uh, 1941. Almost a million people died of measles. Does anybody know anybody here who's had measles? Yeah, I didn't think so. Children inoculated, inoculated against MMR uh, started out really high, and then after that study was published, took a nosedive. And Jenny McCarthy, whose son was diagnosed, and then later not diagnosed with autism, from what I've been told, really jumped on the bandwagon of trying to p not push vaccination for children because of an autism scare, which we should all by now know is complete bullshit. Um, but she started spreading this, and it started spreading FUD and rumors on the Internet in social net networking. Uh, if you get a chance, go to the JennyMcCarthyBodyCount.com. It's an actual website that tracks... People who have died because of easily vaccinable diseases. Uh, the tide is turning back. We are getting more people vaccinated. People are starting to listen more to reason. Uh, ironically, the techniques she used and that were popular was social media, and now people are starting to use social media to once again regain vaccination levels in the U.S. So. Who all remembers the first Gulf War? Thank you. Some of you are probably there. Does anybody know what that green thing, what those two pictures are of? Yeah. Smart bombs? Yeah. Everyone knows the smart bomb. Huh? No. No, it's just a regular picture. Um, 
Does anybody know how many, what percentage of smart bombs we dropped over all? Yes, Bill? Comes out to be 8%. You want some candy, buddy? Oh, yeah. Turns out to be about 8% of the bombs we dropped. But if anybody was watching the news at that point in time, that was all on the screen. That's all you saw for media coverage was smart bombs blew this up. And in fact, the I think it was the first smart bomb they dropped hit a field. And there was a big fur because we don't use our multi-million dollar weaponry to tear up fields, guys. That was kind of a point, too. Um, the media was heavily involved in the first Gulf War, but they were also heavily corralled, especially during the first part. This came straight from the U.S. government to the media to us. Mm, pretty much no filter. Scud versus Patriot? That's all I heard about when I was a kid. Scud missiles. Yeah, 1970s era Soviet technology. Patriot missiles. Super awesome. Also not as effective as they were uh, purported in the, in the news relying on bomb damage assessments, which are very subjective. Yes, I know. But as I said, only about 8% of smart bombs. We also dropped about 29 million leaflets on Iraq telling their soldiers to surrender. That averages out to about 56 leaflets per soldier. And they set up loudspeakers giving surrender instructions in major areas once we had taken them. That is just straight up old school propaganda. Come, you should defect, or you're going to die. Given the choice, I can see why they did. Okay, I don't have a slide for this, but what color does Santa Claus wear? Red? Seriously? Wow. It could be kids watching this. That's not cool. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Prior to 1930s, Santa Claus was depicted in a variety of ways. St. Nicholas started out as a 4th century Turkish bishop and not an overweight Nordic elven guy. You know who we can thank? Well, you can probably read that we can thank Coke for changing him to wearing a red suit. Coca-Cola started a campaign, using Coca-Cola Red, of course, to clad the Santa Claus in. And simple suggestions started allowing people to associate that color red with not only Santa, but Coca-Cola with Christmas and all the happy, good, fun time feelings that are in, I guess, normal households all over across the U.S. Ah, huh? I feel warmer just looking at that picture. Okay, so what can go wrong? Can propaganda ever fail horribly? <laughs> so, I was telling a friend of mine at work I was giving a presentation on this, and he brought to back to me this poster, which is Superman, the Deadly Legacy. It was a DC Comics, comics sorry, that's for you, DC Comics, uh, Production in joint effort with the U.S. government to discourage children from running into fields where there might be landmines and what to do when they find a landmine. Now, there's two problems with this. One, children like to believe in fantasy creatures like Santa Claus and Superman. So some of the children would run into the minefields to meet Superman. Sometimes you got to think these things through. The problem also is, is that in some parts of the world, sending your child into the field to clear the mines is way cheaper than sending your expensive farm animals into the fields to clear the mines. It's just a fact. So some of those kids might not have marched happily into the field looking for Superman. Some of them might have been forced. It, sorry. Um, what else can go wrong? Anybody? Seen any of those around? Internet address and password book. That's awesome. Uh, so let's say you gave a talk on how you need to up your complexity or you just force people to up their complexity through password complexity requirements. And then they rush out to Walden Books or I guess the Barnes & Noble. Some 
somebody, you rush out to your bookstore, Amazon, there you are, rush out to Amazon and get you one of these here uh, lovely places that you can write down your username, your password, the web address. So, they had the right message, more complex passwords, they found an easy out, and they took it. But they still got complex passwords, even if they're all sitting on their desks. So yeah, that can go wrong. All right, I didn't make a slide for this one either, but... So, who's killed more people through their actions? Hitler, Stalin, or Rachel Carson, author from the 1900s? Do you know who Rachel Carson is? Rachel Carson. She wrote the book Silent Spring, which effectively got DDT banned, which effectively caused a spike in malaria because we had very piss poor policies on managing DDT, which is very effective, even in low quantities, of uh, destroying mosquito populations. However, since the ban, millions have died from malaria because we, we really, uh, we kind of just winged it and said, okay, no more DDT. That's why we have programs that are sending nets to Africa, because we don't make DDT, because Rachel Carson. Now, I like birds as much as the next person, and I think this is, could have been a too effective situation. We could have, hopefully, more effectively managed DDT and other programs, but we didn't. And I, I think we can all... Uh, we all know that one person that takes security policy way, way, way too seriously until it becomes a hindrance to business process. One person, one room, one entire division. You know, we all have them. So, in closing, here's some books to go read. They're, they're really good. Uh, the bottom one's kind of dry because it's a English translation of a French translation of a German translation of Goebbels' notes they found in a toilet somewhere. Sorry. But they, he has some very good principles. He is kind of very self-promoting, but he's a propagandist, so you got to kind of overlook it. Questions? Answers? Anything? Nobody? Anyone want some candy? It's peanut buttery. Okay, you can come and kiss me. All right. Thanks, guys.